So the review criteria impact, I'm going to talk about all of these impacts, significance, the investigator team, innovation approach and environment. With significance, we're basically looking at whether the project addresses an important problem or critical barrier to progress in the field. So again, this is where when you're writing your grant proposal, you want to really think about, um, you know, how important is your study? Uh, what priority at the Institute does it address? How are you going to push the field forward with your study? So you don't, NIMH in particular is trying not to look at iterative science. So if it's just an incremental implement, um, you know, improvement over like several other studies you've done that becomes less interesting than something that's really pushing the envelope. You know, so you really want to be thinking about like what's innovative about your, well, that, I'll get into innovation in a second, but how is this a pu an important public health problem? And one of the things I like to do is to think about how does my answering these particular questions potentially help investigators in other fields answer their questions? So if, um, as an example, my, well, my very first um, digital trial, uh, you know, that's exactly what I said. It's like there are three, you know, even though this would benefit the field of mental health, the other areas, uh, you know, uh, other health fields might be interested in the methodologies that we develop and might help them with their use of digital technology to inform disease improvement. Um, and then I also had a, a mechanistic hypothesis that, you know, even though this is prevalent in depression, it's also, depre it's also prevalent in schizophrenia and anxiety disorders. And so what I learned from this project could potentially influence the other fields. So that's sort of where you try to talk about like the narrow public health significance and then broadly, how would you address public health significance? So the investigative team, um, and you know, this the information that uh, the reviewer will look to for this will be your bio sketches. Uh, if you're doing a multiple PI or multiple principal investigator proposal, that's the other place that they look to see what kind of contribution each lead investigator has. This is important in team science proposals. If you're an earlier new investigator, and this only applies to R01s. Do you have appropriate experience and training? Is this the next step for you? And to some degree, they might look at like who else is on the team that might support you, you know, through this process. If you're an established investigator, do you have demonstrate, have you demonstrated an ongoing record of accomplishments that have advanced the field? Again, that's the bio sketch and so forth. So the investigative team, that's actually for a lot of us a pretty quick review. But sometimes what we look for too is like, do you have everybody you need? So if there's a hole in expertise, like for instance, if I propose a study, you know, mental health apps for depression, and I don't have anybody on there who knows anything about user-centered design, that would be something that might, I might get criticized for, right? Like you don't, you don't have the right people on your team. With innovation, the, the idea behind innovation is not that, um, and you really have to be careful about this, do not ever say, this is innovative because nobody's done it before. It might be nobody's done it before because it's not important, okay? So do not use that term. It actually offends a lot of reviewers because they feel like it's lazy. <laughs> um, what you want to say is that it challenges a particular area of science and, it's a and you're hoping that this results in a paradigm shift. Um, you know, whether it's uh, research or clinical practice paradigms, are you proposing novel therapy theoretical concepts? So um, in a couple of months, I'm going to talk about theory, and I'll talk a little bit about how you can use that for innovative innovation. You know, are the methodologies or instrumentations novel? So there's a bunch of things we can look for. Is, it, is there a paradigm shift? Is the approach novel? Is it a novel application of, of something um, like you might have learned in cardiology might be applied to schizophrenia? Taking a big stretch there. Uh, is it a refinement or improvement of a new application? of a theoretical concept, you know, and so forth. So like with innovation, you can sometimes still get a pretty good score and not necessarily get high marks in innovation, but NIMH is really like looking for innovative proposals. So the approach is basically the research strategy. Have you justified your patient population? You know, what are the methodologies you're using? What are the interventions you're testing? You know, do you have, have you considered respondent burden? You know, is your recruitment and retention uh, methodologies, do they 
they look solid. Uh, part of what plays into approach is a, a section called preliminary studies, which is basically showing that you, for an R01, it would be you can do the study um, because you've already tested out the methodologies in an R34 or a pilot study. And for a pilot study, it's is that you've done some preliminary work showing, you know, you're basically saying, well, part of the challenges I'm going to try to address, you know, will be will be addressed here in the, the pilot study, where these are the different approaches we think we're going to take for around recruitment and so forth. Reviewers look for potential problems or benchmarks for success. And I would say, and I'd love to see what Mike and Aaron have to say, I think this is where I see most of the criticisms. <laughs> like people hit really heavy on the approach side. And so you really need to make sure that your research methodologies are thought through. You've justified all of your decisions. And what's nice for clinical trials now, there's a whole separate section that's, that's separate from the 12 page application where you can sit down and justify your statistical methodology. You can have a long discussion about your power analysis. You even can sit down and describe your measures and your thinking behind that, as well as the interventions that you selected. So there's a lot of opportunities to put some more information there that we didn't have for a long time. You know, reviewers will go there, they will review that. So it's just really important to justify your decisions um, that, uh, in terms of the methods. Mike, did you want to chime in on this? Yeah, I mean, I would say significance and approach are kind of the heart of the measure or of the of the proposal, and that oftentimes, what I think I've seen, I don't know if there's evidence for this, but what I think I've seen is that if reviewers don't like your significance and approach, those scores will also be reflected in every other aspect of where they can score you down on innovation um, and everything else because um, because they're central to to your project. And so you're right, like the approach has to be really solid. And if you're going to invest your time, that's the place to invest it in. Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting that you say that the three places I probably iterate the most on my report, my writing are the AIMS page, which is so critical. And we're going to talk about that next month. This the significant section where I'm like, I got to justify this study. And then the methods, which is like, OK, now I make sure everybody knows what we're doing and why we're doing it this way. So you do have a section in the grant proposal called, is it called innovation, you know, and I, I just realized I should probably submit, show you guys some of my proposals that have been uh, successfully funded. But uh, yeah, I think most pe people, they are kind of swayed by the, or not, by your significant section and your methodology and the aims. So the impact score is the final score you get. Um, it it's basically summarizes the overall strengths and weaknesses. I'll, talk about, I'll show you the, what the scoring looks like. Um, and it speaks to the feasibility of the study to, of your proposal to actually address the aims you proposed and to make an impact on the field. It's not an average of all the scores. In fact, sometimes you'll see that it, that's pretty clear. It's not an average that somebody really emphasized in their impact score one area over another and we're told it's not an average so um, but it really is sort of like the final score and determines whether or not you're going to move on to funding i'm going to just briefly go over this a little, little bit but other there are other additional review criteria that can affect your score you know this is discussed before we close the review of the application and it's things like you know how well you protected your human subjects how well representative your sample is going to be what your recruitment plan is like. For those of you who work with animals, <laughs> vertebrae and biohazards kind of stuff, and then your multiple PI plan also can affect the overall score. This is what we look at as a reviewer. This is how our scores are determined. And the chair in the SRO works really hard to keep people to use these numbers and we'll throw it up on the screen, you know, as people are reviewing. As they're talking, you'll hear comments like, this doesn't sound like a three to me, this sounds like a five, you know, and they'll, and they'll point to the, um, to the uh, anchoring here on the, the right hand column. So anything between a three, a one and a three is considered a really good proposal. Um, I would say it sort of depends, sometimes you have a low three, uh, you know, like your, your overall impact score is what's called a 35, because they use double digits, it's an average of the, everybody's review. It, even though it's an excellent proposal, it might still have some concerns that you'll have to address with program. But usually the twos and the ones uh, or the tens and the twenties are actually 
um, you know, fairly, at NIMH, they're, they tend to be fundable. I will mention here that you some um, applications will also get what's called a percentile, and that percentile will usually drive your funding. But for RFAs, so for the special applications, there's no percentile. Um, it's because they're considered novel applications each time, whereas the percentiles for the program announcements are uh, based on the review over the past three cycles of review. Okay, so they keep curbing, you know, um, the review group's uh, um, scores. You know, obviously if you get a 10, that's a perfect score. They're very hard to get. If you get a 12 and somebody recently got one of those, that's, this near, that's a near perfect application. There's essentially no weaknesses. You know, uh, a two is very strong with, you know, there's a few, but they're kind of like whatevers. Um, uh, a three is like, there's some minor weaknesses, but they don't necessarily think that it needs to come back for a second round. And it's usually in this area, um, the ones, the twos and the threes, where program will come back to you and say, okay, let's sit down and um, talk about uh, you writing me up, your response to the review. Because the program officer will then go to the division, as I said earlier, and justify supporting your application based on what you, you, how you would address these more minor weaknesses. You know, six to four, um, those are, you know, usually like there's just too many weaknesses, um, you know, and it's sort of a difference between, you know, like you having a lot of minor weaknesses um, versus having one or more moderate weak. And a moderate weak weaknesses um, generally mean that you have to resubmit um, because uh, they're confused as to why you made that decision or they think it's a bad decision and they want you to come back and, um, and it needs to, that, that change in the application needs to go through peer review again. It can't go through program. So usually fours and fives don't get, or forties and fifties don't get um, a chance, although there is sometimes, like if it's a really innovative study and the potential impact is super, super high and it address a, an area at NIMH that they don't have funding and haven't funded yet, um, they may ask you to still come back with um, a, a response to the reviews and then they will potentially um, support your proposal to council. So that's why I say if you got a score, like in, you know, you actually saw it, it's a 50 or 45, you should actually, it was discussed in the committee because, and when an application gets discussed in the committee, it means that people thought it was actually a pretty cool study. They just wanted to work out like what they thought the problems were. And you might be able to, to not have to resubmit. You might be able to like, you know, and it's kind of up to you as the investigator, you can go ahead and resubmit. The program feels like there might be an off chance that you won't get funded or but they want to try um, or you can just go with program and and see if they'll get it in for for council uh, usually anything below a five doesn't get discussed so even though like the satisfactory fares and marginals don't get discussed oftentimes the fives don't get discussed either um, and part of that is just that you still get the review but you know the written review, but they just don't have time to get to your proposal because um, it would just take forever to go through all of the concerns that they have.